Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. And before we get into it with our guests here today, I'd like to remind everyone that if you enjoy this content, to please give a like and subscribe down below. I'd greatly appreciate it. We have Jenny Smith on the podcast coming to us all the way from Las Vegas, where, I mean, I just have the Elvis Presley song just playing in my head, you know, on loop ever since she told me that. But she's on here to share her health and fitness journey and, you know, yeah, discuss all things health and fitness. And most importantly, she's our current guest. Jenny, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me, Ryan. Thank you. Well, I asked this question first off to every single guest that I've ever had on. Was the weather like in Las Vegas today? Well, I think it's supposed to be 108 tomorrow. So we're about 10 degrees hotter than normal. So it's going to be a hot one today and tomorrow. It's supposed to go a little closer to 100 on Friday, but I'll be in Phoenix competing on Saturday. So it'll be just as hot there. So I, I don't escape the heat. <laughs> oh, my God. 108. That is just. Yeah, it's it's 70 degrees here. So yeah, when I told her before we start recording that the weather's better here, yeah, I'm sorry, but it is. But you know, like I told her before, call me in three months and it's gonna be, you know, like negative twenty, and then you know, I'll 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 take the Vegas weather over that anytime. But before we depress everyone with our, our weather woes, because you know, ugh, 108, good God. I mean, you just you don't even have to cook your eggs, just put put them in your driveway basically and, and they're good to go. Ugh. Why don't you give us your backstory first off on what really inspired and motivated you to get in shape and how that led to where you're currently at right now? Well, I'm actually 41 years old, so I'm a little bit of an older competitor. I've been an athlete for about 31 years. I started competing in track and field when I was 10 in the Junior Olympic track and field. Then went on as an eighth grader, competed in state as an eighth grader. I wasn't even in high school yet. I then got invited at 16 to go run for the USA track and field team in Europe for about a month. And then um, I actually got trained by the actual Olympic coaches that were there in Europe. And that was a transition period for me um, because I was a 400 run, two 400 runner, but I would get up every single morning and go running with the distance team. I grew up on a large cattle ranch, 500 plus acres. So getting up at four or 5 a.m. to go feed the cows and do work was normal to me. It built character to say the least. (laughs) So um, the distance coach pulled me aside that moment in time and said, you are a very unique athlete because you not only have speed, but you have immense endurance that can go the distance. He goes, so you're in the wrong, you're in the wrong um, event. You should be doing an 800 runner. Then transitioned the next year. I then went on and ran D1 uh, track and field for the University of New Mexico. Unfortunately, I got hurt my first year in college. I got stress fractures in my shins. I was very lean, irregular periods for track athletes. So it's a very common injury. I then hung up my my track uh, shoes at that moment. It was a heartbreaking moment for me because I was had a dream of becoming an, Olymp- an Olympic athlete. And especially when you start competing at the age of ten and you're already at nineteen, it was it was it was a hard moment for me. But I then transitioned into bodybuilding at nineteen. I got really big into the weights. I mean, really big. And I, at the time, I was pursuing my civil engineering degree. And I'll never forget. I had a thermodynamics class at seven thirty in the morning. And I went and trained at 7.30 in the morning instead of taking that class. So I failed that class naturally. So I had to take it the next semester. (laughs) But my weight training was on point. (laughs) So um, needless to say, I spent the next uh, decade uh, basically hitting the weights really hard. I then transitioned, moved out to Vegas, opened up my own modeling agency. And I did that for about four or five years. And I always kept bodybuilding in the background. I then decided one day I'm going to do it. And I, because I had that background from age 10 up to the current moment, I went pro in three shows and under in in eight months. So from the time I did my very first show, which was the Las Vegas classic in 2016, I believe it was, I got off stage at that moment. I placed third. I told my husband, I'm going to go get my pro card. It's going to happen. And he's like, okay. Because anything I've ever said I'm going to do, I have done. Um, and so eight months later, I had my pro card. I then did the the Patriot show in July of 2017, I think it was. The Samson sh- that Sam- Patrick Sampson has here. I took first in the open in my class. I didn't get the overall. But then a month later, I went to USA's and I got my pro card. And then I took about eight months I transitioned and I went and did two pro shows in 2017, got my butt kicked. (laughs) The girls were massive, but it was a great learning experience. Very, very, very good learning experience. 
I then um, caught wind of the wellness division coming around 2018-19, and I started to sort of slowly transition because I had two shoulder injuries, tore my shoulder twice. Uh, a year ago, I went under breast reconstructive surgery. I tore my left breast and I had to replace a, a ruptured breast implant on the right. So I've only been back for about a year exactly. So I just did the Tahoe Pro Show. I did my wellness debut in wellness and I took ninth overall and I took second in masters. The judges were really pleased with my look. I did mess up on my posing. Otherwise, I would have been in that top five. <laughs> and then when I look at video, I looked funny. <laughs> we'll get into that later because posing, yeah, that is the number one thing that I would have never guessed before I started this podcast that, it, you know, is is the most important thing. But I mean, getting into bodybuilding, I mean, so many people have so many myths and misconceptions about the sport. Was there anything that you were concerned about the sport or what, when you were getting started? Was it just one of those things that you just wanted to take a full dive into it? Everyone always assumed I was a competitor based on how I look because of my background. So it was one of those things like it was just the next level to transition. I always had a dream of being, like I said, an Olympic Olympia athlete at the age of 19. So when I hear a lot of these younger athletes talk about, oh, I just found out about Olympia 2018. I'm like, that's been my dream for 20 years. So I have a chance and a shot to get there if I have my composure, I have my health, my head held high and I go in with confidence and I nail my posing, it's there. It's just a matter of doing it and practice, practice, practice. It's not so much about practice makes perfect. Practice until you can't, you can't mess up. Practice until you do it in your sleep, blindfolded. So there's a lot that goes into it. We're not just a bunch of meatheads. <laughs> oh, a absolutely. And when you were getting started working out too, I mean, you had a body that was built for track, which is a little bit more of the leaner, you know, just you were built for the endurance. Was that harder sort of converting your body into sort of like building a lot more strength and a lot more size? I can actually build decent muscle. It's, it's holding onto it. I like my level of conditioning was probably the best at the Tahoe show. Hands down. If you see the pictures, you're like, wow. And it was clear as day. Even some of the girls were like, whoa. So the conditioning that's actually to my favor because I'm built like my father and I stay super lean. I mean, my body fat right now is 6% body fat and my cardio has gone down to only 25 minutes of steady and my food keeps on going up. I put the work in throughout my prep. So I'm now eating into this show versus other girls who didn't do the work are now having to kill themselves on cardio and limited food. So I'm, I'm cruising right now. I'm in a really good spot right now. I'm in a very favorable spot. I'm, I just touch away and I get pumped. So if there's not a whole lot. I just got to get there to the show, which is Saturday, and I'm I'm good. Well, and I love to talk genetics on this podcast, too, because so many people do not understand that that look that you get on stage, I mean, you're not going to be able to get it, you know, if you're the average general public. Because so many people, they don't understand that, you know, if you work out just like some of these competitors, yeah, you're not going to see those results. But everyone always has that one body part when they first get started working out that really, really takes off that they don't have to train as much. And then everyone always has that one body part that just drags behind it. They have to train to oblivion. I mean, for me, my back was the one thing that really took off for me. But I'm also 6'3", so my legs and my lower body are just absolutely oh, wow. shot. Yeah, so like literally anything lower body is just it's it's an uphill battle the, i've always made the joke and, oh yeah exactly i've always made the joke that i could inject pure muscle into my legs and my calves and they wouldn't even gain an ounce i mean it is absolutely ridiculous i i was sort of like you know i had that average pitcher's body where you know you're just long and length lengthy mm -hmm. and just able so but what were those body parts for you were getting, when you were getting started what was one that really took off and then one, what was one that really dragged behind well, um, initially I was, I was competing in figures. So when I first started competing, I was actually built like a wellness competitor, very unbalanced, thick legs, thick. I mean, my, my glutes take over every movement. I'm glute dominant. So, cause I was a track athlete. So, um, I would step on the track and be like, dude, those glutes are insane. So those have always been there. In fact, I have four sisters. We all have the same glutes. It's genetics. And then I took it a step further and I, really worked on them. So the legs and the glutes really come on their own. Um, it's my upper body was lacking. So I had to literally stop working out my lower half for about a year to build this up. And then now that I'm switching over to wellness, I'm going reverse. So it's okay though, because I'm actually training the way I like to train. I feel comfortable. I'm healthier. I'm not banging out these upper body movements that my body can't handle. Some girls can go handle working their upper body three, four times and recruiting the same muscles. Mine, no, I tore the shoulder twice. 
versus my lower half, I can go damage my lower half four days a week. And don't get me wrong, I'm dying and I'm sore, but other curls will recruit injuries. My body's designed, it's been bred, it's been, I've worked 20, 30, actually 30 years in my lower half. So it was a natural going backwards and I'm like, yay. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that, that, that must've been a really good thing for you. And I mean, I mean, let's be honest, nutrition is, you know, 80 to 90% of the results that you're going to see in this sport. And I mean, I still have friends who God bless them to this day. They think that they can go work out, you know, have their Burger King, you know, two or three times a week. And it's like, well, you know, we're 27, 28 years old right now. So, you know, call me in 10 years and tell me how that's working out for you. But I mean, it is just so much more impactful than people like to give it credit for. But what were some of the bigger nutritional changes that you made when you started to get into the building, the size department? Because I mean, if you're a track athlete, you can really, you know, get away with a lot of eating just because you have to burn off all that stuff that you're working. It's that's probably one of those difficult times I would say for most female athletes is the building phase, because you do put on that excess body fat, but the goal is to not get too far away from stage weight. Because remember, as we're gaining muscle, the goal is to add muscle mass while minimizing our body fat. And the in the reverse, we're trying to maintain our muscle mass when we lose weight while losing body fat. So it's very tricky and strategic on both ends. But the hardest part for females is putting on that ex excess fluff because they get like, oh my God. And I get I get it because you go from one extremity to the next. Me, I'm so seasoned at this. I put on some baggy clothes and I go to work. I don't worry about that. Because at the end of the day, everything is temporary. Even right here, right now, this moment, this leanness is temporary. And I know that. So I live in the moment for right here, right now. And I try to really like swim in the moment because I know for a fact, especially having to sit out for the last four years, that at any moment, the wheels could fall off this. <laughs> so I'm trying to embrace every waking moment that I have left in the sport. And I could have 10 years. Maybe I could have three. I don't know. But that's the way I look at it. Nutrition-wise, what changed for me was just honestly having to adapt to eating more food. Having to, you're almost like pushing the envelope of like you're, you're force feeding yourself. I like to consider the off season like you're a hibernating bear. You're eating and sleeping and recovering. So you're kind of laying around and you're not lazy, but you're like cardio goes down, food goes up. So it's a it's a mind. Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse no, absolutely, me. absolutely. And I mean, this is just so much more of a mental sport than it is a physical sport. As much as people like to just notice the physical attributes that the sport comes with, that mental journey that you're on is a hundred times more <laughs> than the physical journey. And how has that really shaped you as a person? Because I always tell people, I mean, if you can compete in even one show, you have gained the mental strength that you can really almost do anything in your life. I agree. I like to refer to it as peeling layers of an onion. And what I mean by that is here I am going through prep. The first couple of weeks are always the hardest because your, your body's, it's being forced to adapt to change. And it, technically the species that's the strongest is not the most that will survive. It's the species that can adapt to change the best. That is the stronger species and that's the one that survives. So with that being said, I had to learn to adapt and change. And that was very, very, very difficult. In fact, I think at six weeks into this prep, I lost my I completely lost it, lost my composure. And and through that layers of peeling onions, sometimes you reveal a layer, you're like, oh my God, I'm amazing. You reveal an amazing characteristic, you're like, oh my gosh. And then on the flip side, that next layer, you realize you're an asshole that day and that you, there's a lot of work you need to be done and not being serious. So not every layer reveals something that you want to see. And you're like, oh, I'm awesome. No, majority of the time it's layers that you're like, oh crap, I gotta work on that because you're vulnerable. You're literally stripping away every layer of yourself. You're so vulnerable and so exposed that the real you comes out. Does that make sense? Oh my God. 1000. I've had friends where like, you have those friends where you have deep talks with, I was like, just warn you ahead of time. You might not like what you find, but you know, just, just, you know, buyer beware, but you know, yeah, I totally get that where, yeah, everyone always talks about how much stronger it makes you like the mental side of the sport, but there are also times where it doesn't, I mean, it really does reveal your true, not your true self, but I mean, everyone has bad days and everyone has those days where they don't want to work out and go with that. And like you mentioned those days where you do feel like crap, how do you push through? Because I think that's what really differentiates you know, the average person from the, from the competitors or the competitors are able to find a way to go through and, you know, still get the training in and still, you know, push through. Honestly, setting up a routine, 
day in, day out. Like I'll give you an example. The night before, here's my, my notepad. So I believe in how we end the day and start the day dictates the middle part of our day, right? So like if I end my day and I don't prepare myself for the next day because I'm not a morning person, then I kind of drag through the day and I'm just like kicking my feet and, and I knew I had to see you today. So I had to make my list and I had to get up and do my morning cardio. My fat, I do all that. Yeah, I had to get ready, you know? So like, if I don't, if I didn't do what I did last night to prepare for my morning, this could have been not as smooth and transition. So everything is, so routine is probably the biggest thing because most of the time we're not motivated. I'm like, come on, who wants to go do it? An hour of fasted cardio in the morning without having food. You're just like, mm. but meditating first thing in the morning is how I roll out of, out of my bed. I get out of bed and I do like a little 10 minute meditation. I haven't put my meditation music on. And then I go into like a stretch, like just kind of stretching out my hips. And I have my own unwinding the hips movements that I do for about 10 minutes. And then I get up and I have my lemon water, blah, 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 coffee. You know, I try to just, and I try to read for about 10 minutes the first thing in the morning instead of watching TV, getting on Instagram, anything, no technology, just kind of honing in it to me because the day of the show, that's what matters most, right? Is those moments where you're nervous, you're freaking out. But if you're already into a routine where you're calming yourself down, you're meditating, you're stretching, you're preparing and visualizing how your day's going to go, you're, once again, practice, practice, routine. It, I mean, that is one thing that I really do stress to people is that the routine that you do develop too. And I mean, it's, it's sort of like, I forgot what the thing was, but if you do something for like 40 straight days or 20, I forgot what it was. I mean, then it becomes a habit and then. Yeah, once you get into that routine, I can, I mean, I can remember even in college, you know, just having that routine down because that was when I was at my most in shape because I had so much more free time than I, than I do now. Just, you know, you really just have everything just down pat where, yeah, it, it really does just become, you know, second nature to you. But yeah, I mean, this is just, don't you know, wrong. I don't want to do any of that. There's, oh, oh my God. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there were days too, even with me too. Where, yeah. All the time. And I'm like, and I, I the biggest thing is not getting down on yourself and telling yourself negative thoughts because our thoughts control everything. Our mindset controls everything. And believe it or not, I'm reading a book now where it talks about controlling that negative thought because that negative thought can overtake the entire thought process and then your entire day and you've, you've lost. So it's, it, this has been the biggest mo mental game this show because um, I'm coming off a four year hiatus. I'm older, you know what I mean? New, new division, unfamiliar territory. So a lot of meditation and inner work was needed for this round. She talks about older and I have, I'm 27 and I have friends that look older than her. So, you know, that's the benefits of working out, you know, everyone that, that really goes through. That's the one thing that I like to preach as well. But I mean, cardio is my number one pet peeve. I mean, I hate it more than life itself. And when I say cardio, I mean like actual running, like I could walk on a treadmill. Like I do that all the time and I go out for walks, but being that you are a former runner, which, you know, I characterize that as a mental illness myself. Cause I'm like, who wants to do that? Who wants to do that? Like who, who signs up for that? But what is your relationship like with cardio? Do you find that, you know, obviously you enjoy it more being that you had that history with it? Or is it one of those things now where you realize that, you know, it's, I mean, like when you do become a bodybuilder, you sort of do have to sign a deal with the devil when it comes to cardio. Your analogies are fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Uh, you know, it's a love-hate relationship, I think, for everyone. And I say it like this. When we're in, in my off-season, I love it. I only do about three days of cardio, 30 minutes, because when I turn on the heat, it's like, whoa. Like, my first week of prep, I lost eight pounds. My coach was like, whoa. I'm like, hey, I'm like a, a horse. Once you let those reins go, I'm going to keep on running until you say stop. So you got to keep your eye on me. And that's just how it is. Now, it, now that I'm conditioned and it's not a big deal because I've adapted back to adaptation. But those first initial couple of weeks when I start prep, I'm like, are you kidding me right now? <laughs> and I have to like, I do like steady and interval type cardio where maybe I'll do 35 minutes of steady cardio to begin my cardio session. And then the last 25 minutes I'll do interval where I run on the Stairmaster at level 20 for a full minute. And then I walk at level five for a full minute, run for a minute, walk for a minute. And I do that for 25 minutes repeated. So that sucks. But like I said, so <laughs> and I look like a freak on the treadmill. By the time like, I got to like the six minutes, I'd be too busy panting from the minute running that I wouldn't even be able to like get up to the running again then. And I, there's, there's times I almost trip on the yeah. stairmaster. People are like, what the hell? I'm like, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I got this. <laughs> 
So it's, it's a love hate. Like once I have to transition to my off season and that cardio has to go down, I get a little nervous because during the transition period, everyone change freaks everyone out. So I just have to remind myself, it's okay. This is the next step. We are transitioning. This is temporary. Pick, pick your, put your big girl panties on and let's get to work. And that's the way to do it. The girls that don't succeed are the ones that constantly are on stage, constantly worried about staying lean. You have to get a little uncomfortable. You have to be willing to say, hey, this is what it is. This is what it takes. And, you know, but that's also, that's, I'm older. I've, I've done this. So I'm up. Eh. Yeah. And before we get into posing, I mean, the other number one thing that I like to tell people is the most important part of this sport and in life in general, but most people do not talk about it is sleep. And I don't care what anyone says. If anyone, you know, tells me different, I tell them go spend an all nighter and then go and try to work out and tell me how that works. I tried that twice in college and both times I asked about halfway through and I was like, okay, yeah, this is ridiculous. I can't, I had to go back and get some sleep, but especially as you're getting closer to your show right now, I mean, yeah, you're like a, less than a week out. Sleep becomes even harder for the most of the guests that I've talked to just because your body is just so depleted at this moment. But because like you said, you're not a morning person and me as well. I mean, I, I got up like two hours before we had to do this podcast. So I was I was just, you know, it's still, still still getting my morning coffee and stuff. But what are some things that you try to do to get that proper amount of sleep? Because especially as you get closer to this show, I mean, it's becoming almost impossible. And what it is, it's your, it's your two hormones, your ghrelin and your leptin. They're, they're your suppress, optite suppressin and your, they, they just, they're, they're off because you're so low in body fat. So sometimes how I kind of trick that is if I can, I'll have carbs and fat in my last meal to help me go into sleep to trick those hormones. But if I don't have that option, I do several remedies. I have different sleep supplements. I use GABA, which is a natural anxiety. I use um, ashwagandha in the morning. There's just certain supplements I use. I also drink like just a, a sleepy time tea that I get at the grocery store has valerian root. Um, but I do have a sleep supplement and then I consume a lot of THC and CBD on a daily basis. That's just, I've been doing that for 20 years. I'm a huge advocate for it. Um, I think that that's why I stay, stay young because I'm a little stressed out and worried about stupid you know what I mean? and, but CBD immediately after I work out, it just gets rid of the inflammation. And then right before I go to bed, cause it helps just really relax me. So you're into CBD before it became like this whole big thing, really? Oh yeah. Like that's why when people are like, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I've, yeah. I, and that's, you know, I have taken CBD myself and I can praise really its benefits, but now we get into the real nitty gritty. I mean, posing is the one thing that I would have never guessed in a million years before I started this podcast that, you know, impacts people more than they're working out more than their nutrition. But I like to compare it now to being a perfect driver where you can be a great driver. You can never be a perfect driver. You can be a great poser. You can never be a perfect poser. It's always ever evolving. What is your experience with posing been like, especially since you said your last show, you struggled a little bit with it. Um, I'm going to present this in two different ways. There's two sides to the coin when it comes to competing. The first one is bringing a package that is worth placing, right? So some girls don't do that. They don't come in condition, X, Y, and Z. So it's, it's bringing the package, right? The next one is presenting the package. It's like when you go to Nordstrom, you get that, that package all pretty up and perfectly packaged. Well, that's a perfect, it could be a piece of in that package, but it's how it's presented, right? So you have to have both sides of that coin. You have to have the package and you have to present it. And the other thing is, is the head judge Sandy told me at my last figure show four years ago, Jenny, we're not looking for what you're doing right. We're looking for what you're doing wrong. Because think about it. At the end of the day, we all look fantastic at the end of the day. But the people that took the extra time to really pose and make themselves look presentable, those are the ones you can tell practice and they walk with confidence and you can see it. That's what separates the top from the bottom. I mean, there is p politics involved in every sport. I don't care what you say. I mean, or anyone says that is the nature of the beast. But at the end of the day, if you give them a package that's undeniable and a presentation that's undeniable, hey, that all you can say is I did my best and that's what matters. So posing, I would say, is probably the most important thing when it comes to this sport. Because like I said, you could have the best package on, on stage but if you don't know how to present it to the judges with confidence, smiling, and your, your your facial expressions go with each pose perfectly. Absolutely. 
And what was the hardest aspect about posing to you? Because for some people, it's, you know, sort of the conditioning that has to require because you're not meant to be, as a human being, you're not meant to be in that flex of a state for that long a period of time. For other people, it's just, it's just getting the timing right. For some people, it's those high heels that you have to wear. I mean, there are so many things in this sport that I could really just make a list of when it comes to posing. Yeah, heels do make a difference. I mean, you have to find the right heels for you. I've gone through several, several different types of heels to find the right ones for me. I'm shorter, so for me, if it's too tall, it makes me look awkward. Um, and practicing in the heels on a regular basis. A lot of girls practice barefoot, but then when you transition to the heel, it's like, whoa, this is so different. Yeah. So I really try to enforce posing in the heels, especially at six weeks out. Just keep on that. And out of your poses that you do for wellness now, what is your favorite pose and what is your least favorite pose? Well, <laughs> my favorite is probably my back pose because it is amazing. I will say that right now. Um, even the judges said so themselves. That is spot on. And most shows are one from the back. So my side poses are, my left one is a little bit different than the right. My right one's perfect. My front, the front pose and the back pose is rewarded the most. So I messed up on my front pose. I leaned too forward. Like if I was bowing, it was, it was embarrassing. <laughs> hey, you can, I, I'm allowed to laugh at myself. And that's part of this process is learning and moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. When you are walking on that stage, I mean, what is that feeling like for you? Because I mean, you are going through basically hell and when it comes to preps really just to be able to walk up on that stage and what is that moment like when you finally get to you know show off all that hard work that you've worked months upon months on what's well, an instant rush of butterflies in your stomach and then you realize hey this is i've been waiting for this moment for 20 years so this is my time to shine and you get like a rush of just energy and endorphins and it's it's like a high it's like a rush you're just like <gasps> You know what I mean? And if you're able to hone in on that energy and utilize it, beautiful things happen. But if you allow that energy to overcome you and take over your presence and well, <laughs> don't be like Jenny and you're a deer in headlights. <laughs> um, this next one will be amazing. I, I'm so prepared, but yeah, it's, it's just posing, posing. It comes down to posing. I promise you. And when you're on that stage, does time seem to slow down or speed up or is it sort of a mixture? A mixture because there's times where it's like it seems like it went by so fast and I'm like oh what happened and then there's other times where it's like okay it's going like it, it it's just uh, what's going on like, it's time just slowing down you know <laughs> but this last show at home show I will say it ran so smoothly I mean they were on point on time in fact so much so there was men's busy competitors about to go on but the pros were going on at a certain time they actually stopped them. And us master girls went on, we're like, oh, we weren't even really pumped up. We're like, oh, crap. You know what I mean? Because we kind of watch how the show is being run. But some shows, if it's not running, like if they're behind schedule, and the pros have to go on at a certain time, they will stop the NPC and say, hey. So, I mean, I appreciate that. But we're like, oh, so it's best just to be backstage, ready, food already in body, pumping up, ready to rock and roll. That way, when they say it's time to go, it's time to go. But for the most part, it goes pretty fast. This last show went fast. I was shocked. But this next show is going to be a really big show. It's the Arizona Pro Show. which It's an all-women show. So that's where um, they have their women's bodybuilding like championship. So it's a really, really nice big show. Yeah. And I hate to ask this question knowing that you're so close to the show, but what is what is one meal that you're looking forward to m having most afterwards? <laughs> no, I, I, don't, I don't really have a sweet tooth. I don't like – people are like, how is – I make cakes for people like when, like today I'm make some cakes for people like I don't but the one meal I really really want like a pastry <laughs> like I like the donuts well first of all it's fried bread who doesn't like fried bread like and then you throw some glaze on it I mean um I love burgers fries pizza but I probably this time around I think I'm gonna go for some pasta I'm really been, I've been watching some pasta channels and I've been like tagging them and that in like a pastry. You know what I'm talking about, right? A nice Okay, place. so yesterday was the last day of the Minnesota State Fair, which is the biggest state fair in the country. And we have there, I went to it yesterday. They have deep fried Twinkies that have that are that have a layer of uh, caramel on top of the Twinkie. Then they put chocolate on top of that layer of caramel. One of the best things I've ever had in my entire life. <laughs> is that real? A fried Twinkie? I thought yep. those were like 
thought that was like a unicorn type thing. It's it, it's real. They have it, and they had they have they have everything there. I mean, they have donuts that are like that too. I mean, yeah, I I probably had at least you know six seven thousand calories, and I'm still dealing with it t- today. But you know, it was well worth it. <laughs> <laughs> next time take a picture and send me that so I, I like will to- <laughs> i will because it's i mean they 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 even have like deep fried walleye and stuff like that i mean they have they have everything there it, it's right stuff i'm not gonna lie like deep fried stuff i'm like mm-hmm. they got the foot long corn dogs and everything i mean those are oh. those are my favorite too and then you know yeah it's just i i, I mean it, it goes into it where i know that i have to save up you know about for about a week or two at before ahead of time. Cause I was like, you know, I'm going to be spending a couple hundred dollars at, at least there. So, you know, but Hey, it is well worth it. And I hate to mention all that food to you, knowing that you, you're, you know, you're chomping at the bit, but yeah, a- absolutely. And we talked about it a little bit, but I mean, post-show blues is one thing that really needs to be talked about a little bit more because one of the things that people don't understand is that I deal with so many people in the general public who say, you know, like they're, they're, they're more like they're shocked by the, the fact that when I tell them that these guests don't look like that 24 seven, they, a lot of them are just like, Oh my God, really? And I, I tell them, I was like, if you were to like meet some of these bodybuilders in off season for some of them, you might not be able to even tell that they work out in the first place because it's just, and that's just, and that's just how it is. But how do you personally deal with that post-show blues? Because I mean, the way that you look right now, I mean, I can imagine that, you know, the moment you start to gain weight, it's like, Oh my God, you know, I, I don't look like the way that, you know, I, I looked when I was, you know, working my butt off. How do you mentally deal with that? And has it gotten easier for you as your journey has gone on to sort of deal with this, you know, mind I'd like to say when it comes to post show blues? Um, it gets as easy as you allow it to. Does that make sense? Once again, mindset's everything and you control every aspect that goes in and out of your thoughts. So initially when I first competed as a figure competitor, I was, I, I, it hit me hard. I was super depressed for about a good year. I'm not, I'm not even kidding you. I was like, and I'm not like, I'm a hyper high energy, happy person, but I was like, ugh bodybuilding actually competing actually f- me up body image wise i never had any body image issues i if you ask me I was like i'm the husband in the room <laughs> that no okay so that's one thing that i found funny too is that it, it does cause body image issues for people when you're, like, oh when you're like when you look like you're the, in the top 0.001 percent of the general public you don't think that these people would have body image issues but they do and i tell all my clients this is not normal let me just start that real quick and i had to do things to do, that are not normal to get here now, mind you, I've had 30 years of preparation of becoming an athlete to get here and get here as quickly as I did, but it's because of the years that people didn't see. You can't compare my first, your first chapter one to my chapter 20. You know what I mean? Your thousand, your first session. And, and if it does, if you do look like her like that after working out for a little bit, you know, give me your number and I, I'll spend my okay. entire life saying as a trainer. Exactly. With you. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So um, it's hard. And the biggest thing is I try to set up like little mini events for myself, like as like to keep myself going, like maybe after this show, I'll set up a photo shoot a month away. So I still stay relic. Like I'll put on some healthy weight, but I have something to look forward to. Uh, Maybe I put a trip right after that. Like, you know what I mean? Like I literally tell people plan something, have something to look forward to, whether it's a birthday party, an event, a trip, a photo shoot, whatever it is, have a mini goal because those mini goals will keep you going to that main event. And that's the way I look at it. And then just, like I said, staying in your routine and planning things out like maybe this month I want to accomplish X, Y, and Z and keeping busy. I cannot stress that. Like a lot of competitors afterwards, because they start to put, they get depressed, they don't want to go to the gym because they don't look the same. It's part of the process. We have to accept all stages of life. Absolutely. I mean, the moment that you mentioned it was 108 degrees or it's going to be 108 degrees there. What is your water consumption like? Because even up here, I mean, for mine, it's ridiculous. And I'm not living in a climate where I could basically burn to death. <laughs> in fact, speaking of, let me grab my water. Not a problem. Uh, as far as water, it's I drink about 120 ounces a day. But remember, I don't, I'm not really outside. Like, that's like, how do you stand in this heat? I'm like, well, we don't go outside. That's why. <laughs> we stay in air conditioning. <laughs> we go from one building to the next to our car. <laughs> I do pose outside in the evening, though, because I force myself to get sweaty and uncomfortable because then my feet sweat, which means that on stage when I'm nervous, they're going to sweat anyhow because of my hyperhidrosis. So I'm preparing myself for what I'm going to go through. So like yesterday, I was like sweating like a little hog out there because it was hot, but I'm doing it purposely to torture myself. So 
So like I'll inc increase my water this week, 25%. So I'll be consuming 150, 160 ounces of water a day. So I'm. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's the only problem with this sport tour. One of the problems that, yeah, I mean, you're, you're going to have a lot of restless nights too, especially having to get up and go to the bathroom, you know, like seven or eight times, but Hey, hey it's, it's, it's worth it for, you know, the, the end product that it results. But I mean, like, let's be honest, you're not the average looking 41 year old woman. I mean, I always like to compare bodybuilders to sort of like mini celebrities where, I mean, you are just going to draw people's attention. What has that sort of been like for you? Cause for some people it's, you know, it's kind of weird when people just come up to them and say like, Oh wow, you look amazing. But how have you dealt with all that, you know, extra added attention that you might get? Ah, it's, it's weird sometimes. <laughs> it's, um, I've always had that kind of attention my whole life. So I've, I've, I've learned to just, I'm not going to look like this forever. So appreciate it. Appreciate the compliments. And also I've had to learn to stop and take the time to talk to people because, mm, and I'm not a very, um, I'm an introvert. I'm just naturally an introvert. I stick to myself. I've always been like that. I'm a lone wolf. I've always been like that. I have lots of friends, but I'm a loner. Can you so, tell that I'm not an introvert? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, we get along great. <laughs> so I know an introvert I'll do all the talking. I'll do all the talking for you. Right? That's why I tell my friends they're introverts. Yes. <laughs> so, um, like in this setting, like it's if we're talking oh, shop. Whatever. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. But I do. I uh, it, it is a little weird, but I have to remind myself people are, are impressed by what you've done, and if you can motivate and inspire them by sharing some light and maybe giving some them some motivation when they stop you instead of getting frustrated like oh i'm trying to do my thing right now you know um i am doing this to also help people you know i have my own set of clients i do want to inspire and help people and show people that this you don't have to look like this but you can change your life at any moment in time i'm 41 years old i'm a perfect example of like you don't age is just a number yeah hormones change at 41 but that doesn't mean that we're going to say oh my god my life's over like no it's <laughs> We're going to adapt with the new changes and we're going to continue to move forward. <laughs> so as far as for the attention, it's, it's, um, sometimes it's uncomfortable when you're in the middle of the workout at the gym and some guy comes up to you like, Hey, can I see your photos at the, con at the contest? Yeah, that's annoying. And sometimes I have to fi find a way to be courteous and to not be rude because they are a follower. They're someone who's, you know, inspired by me, but I have to be like, sure, no problem. I'm in the middle of my workout. Why don't we? you know, 20 minutes, let's meet by the coffee bar. Like, you know what I mean? So learning to be more patient and humbled at the same time. It's a combination and leaving the ego at the door, never forgetting where the f you came from. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. I get that, you know, 1000%. And if there was any piece of advice that you'd like to give anyone who just walked up to you on the street and just say, oh my God, you look amazing. I want to get in shape. What's the best piece of advice that you'd like to give? Because unfortunately, everyone's body is built differently. So not one piece of advice is going to work for everybody. And that's the one thing that I think really, you know, makes it so that a lot of people don't ever really try to really get into a really super healthy and fit state is that, you know, it's going to be a lot of trial and error. But what what is one general piece of advice that you just like to give someone just to get started? Because I found that, you know, just taking that first step into the gym, it is hard to take that step out of the gym without getting a workout in. Um, I would start it with, like I start every consultation that I have with my clients is what is your why? Why? And it usually takes me to, I ask you that like five to 10 times to finally get the real answer out of them. Oh, well, I want it. No, no, no. Oh, no. Why? Because when you lack the motivation and the will to get your out of bed to do cardio at 5 a.m., you need to go back to your why. And usually for a lot of these people, it's like, I'm 30 pounds overweight, I'm 40, and I want to be able to play with my kids and my grandkids. That There you go. Boom. That is the real reason right there. Longevity, healthy. So once you actually break people down from the superficial aspect and we get to the real reason, because that's when you don't have, you got to go back to that. The why and the routine. Just developing a solid routine that you know that's going to work for you and the betterment of your future. If you can just do those two things, you're good because they're going to they're going to outbeat motivation and all that other stuff that's short lived, you know. And as much as it pains me, I always tell people just to get started walking. I mean, that's the easiest thing that you can do. Just get started with that. I mean, it's it's free. It's you know anybody can really do it, and it's just. Yeah, it's that's the one thing that I always tell people, just get started with that. But Jenny, if we were to talk to you a year from today, where would you like to be at in your bodybuilding journey? Where would you like to just be at in your overall life? What are some goals that you'd like to have achieved? I definitely want to get my business off the ground with with my personal training even more so. 
I would like to develop like an app for my uh, followers. Um, a lot of people have really asked me to develop like an app, YouTube, stuff like that, um, just to, um, cause I have great workout videos. I just don't post enough. I just need to be, get more involved with my community of people that I inspire and I help. Um, so just business aspect. I met also, I'm going to be at Olympia. That's where I want to be. I'll be on stage at that Olympia. That's the goal. I think you're going to kill it too. And before I wrap things up, Jenny, I mean, it is just so great having you on. Is there anyone that you'd like to give a shout out to before we wrap things up? Um, just shout out to my husband, my, my daughter, and also my coaches, uh, Nikki and Johnny Casalina. They are both just amazing people. Um, uh, thank you to you as well, Ryan, for providing me this platform to be able to talk about my journey and who I am. And I really, Appreciate it. It's um, my absolute pr pleasure. Well, and I forgot to ask this too. So what was your friends and family's reaction like when you announced them, hey, I want to be a bodybuilder? What was that? What was that like for them? <laughs> well, that's funny you say that because I actually had this dream when I was a little girl. My my mother was working on her master's in genetics or something at the university. I come from a very smart family, professors. And and there was an anatomy picture of a of, of just the muscular structure of a body, no skin, right? Just the muscles. And I looked at my mom, that was probably nine eight, nine, 10, around there. I go, and I didn't speak growing up. I was, they, they call me mute kid. And I go, I'm, I'm going to be that when I grow up, but with skin on. She goes, what? I go, I'm going to be that, but with skin on. <laughs> she goes, okay, okay. Like, and as I got older, I always said, I'm going to have my own TV show with me working out on TV. I would, you know what I mean? I, that's, that was my goal. I was like, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a world famous athlete. <laughs> Anatomy picture. I'm going to be that, but with skin on. That's so crazy. <laughs> hey, hey, I'm glad to know that that anatomy picture inspired at least one little girl somewhere to, you know, follow her dream. So that's great. And then I, I had one final question before we wrap it up. I mean, that endurance that you get from, from running, I mean, is, it's just more power to you. Do you think that that helped you in any way, shape and form when it came to the endurance that you need to have mentally for bodybuilding is just having that background. Cause I mean, I have gymnasts on and obviously they have that musculature background that really helps them or swimmers, but with running, do you really think that that whole mindset that you get from running? Because like you have so much free time when you're running, cause you're just in your mind really basically. Whereas in bodybuilding, when you're working out, you're in your mind. You have to remember, I started competing at an elite level at 10. So for me, I had to develop a mental strength that was not normal at that age. In fact, I didn't have a normal childhood. My parents probably pissed that I even say this, but my I, my dad forced me to run down a dirt road with a tire. I had rope burns down my neck. Oh, I'm not even kidding you. I didn't have a normal childhood. So like, <laughs> like imagine having to develop that type of mental strength at such a young age. So yes, running definitely helped me. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, imagine having to go for... I'd, I'd run 10 miles some, some Sundays and you're, all you have is your own thoughts. There was no iPod back then or music to distract you. It was you and your thoughts. So it most definitely helped. I, I, I'm very grateful for all of it. Hey, making me feel bad about myself all the time. You know, Hey, I go out for, I go out for those runs and I'm like, Hey, I, I, I got my iPod. Yeah. I could not imagine even running without, you know, the technology that we have today, just because yeah, without music, I would just be like, what is going on after like about five minutes just about running, but Hey, more power to you. And again, you know, Jenny, we cannot thank you enough for coming on and sharing your story and we wish you nothing but the good best. This podcast will be out in about a week. So it'll be right after your show. So I'll have a little thing telling us how great you did. And I mean, yeah, I honestly, I think you're going to do great. And again, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome, Martin. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Well, this is Ryan Johnson, DD on the spot, signing off. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.